thank you all for being here. My name is Laura. I know many of you. Um, I work in the education department. And I'm so excited to be introducing today's conversation. Um, and I want to introduce it really as that, a conversation. This is really a glimpse into some internal conversations that we've been having at the museum around difficult or even traumatic objects in our collection. Um, and you may be surprised to hear that we have difficult objects. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you may be surprised that it's taken us this long to sort of publicly acknowledge that and talk about it. Um, so as museum professionals, it's our job to preserve and share history, uh, even when that history includes objects that represent trauma. Um, so today we'll be delving a little bit into what it means to prevent those objects from causing additional harm to others. Um, without hiding them away, right? Or pretending that they don't exist. Uh, so we're, we're gonna be talking about that balance. And I'm so pleased and honored to be introducing two of my wonderful colleagues today, uh, both of whom care very deeply about this issue and bring a lot of thoughtfulness to the topic. Um, so today you'll be hearing from Jennifer Lemmer Posey, who is the Tibbles Curator of Circus, and Marion Carpenter, who is our Associate Director of Collections and Chief Registrar. And I did also just wanna mention that we are committed to making this an ongoing series so at least once a quarter, we'll be exploring other items or stories from the circus collection that may be difficult or problematic when viewed through today's contemporary lens. So stay tuned for those. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Mari and Carpenter. Um, and Mari, you want to unmute and say hello? Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Laura. And thank you, Jennifer. Uh, this is going to be a great uh, presentation. I just wanted to let you guys know a little bit about myself. Uh, even though I hold the title of Associate Director for Collections, Chief Registrar, um, I also have a degree in, um, two degrees, in American History, um, in looking at Afro Studies, as well as my Master's in uh, African American uh, History, American History with a concentration in African American History. And um, uh, that degree was at University of Cincinnati, and then I also went to Indiana University. Um, but I really wanted to talk a little bit about my love for public history. And I'm considered a public historian. Uh, I've been in the field for a number of years. And one of the things as a public historian is really looking at social history and the impact of social history on our um, conversations and objects surrounding uh, different topics throughout history. And some of the things that I have experienced, and I'm, I'm not gonna take too much time, but some of the things I've experienced in reviewing and helping to catalog or to uh, research uh, different collections, particularly in history museums, uh, does did unearth objects that uh, were difficult to talk about, racial stereotypical objects. So um, with that, I have made it, uh, one of the things that I'm passionate about is uh, using those objects as teaching tools, uh, having a, a, a real clear conversation about those objects, and what does it mean to the narrative of American history. So I really was uh, uh, grateful to be a part of the conversation when Jennifer and uh, Laura approached me to ask if I could uh, lend some of my um, uh, experiences and also uh, some of the things that I have been um, researching about throughout my career in museums. So I'm, I'm here as a voice and hopefully to have a, a conversation with all of you all if you have questions. So thank you. Jennifer. <laughs> Great, yes. Hi everybody, I am Jennifer Limmer Posey. I am the Tibbles Curator of Circus at the museum and I see a lot of familiar faces. I appreciate you all for joining us this afternoon. And I, I, I love the fact that this, uh, strange new venue of Zoom has become a kind of safe space to have conversations um, and, and particularly to explore, explore the circus collections in new ways. Uh, those of you who have heard me speak before know I love my job, I love the circus, uh, but I'm not blind to some of the bigger questions that a lot of people have about the circus. There's a lot of controversial issues that are embedded in circus history because circus itself as, as Miriam was alluding to, is embedded in a bigger cultural history. Uh, and, and I've been really eager to start opening places for dialogue about, about issues of, of race, of animal welfare, of gender, of, of all of these topics that are, that are deep and need exploring. My first impulse as a curator is to try and do that in the galleries you know, with the objects right there at hand. But 
what we found, um, and, and I've been very grateful for my two colleagues who are joining me here and in, in helping me work through this, is that sometimes some of these objects have such big stories that to put them in a space and hope that a visitor will read 150 words of text is never, never going to get to the root of what, what the good questions are to ask about it. And so that was how this, this conversation started. I will say, honestly, at first we had the idea that we would explore a few topics in this 40 minutes. And then we realized, well, that's just not gonna go well. So as Laura mentioned, we, we really are committed to making this an ongoing conversation to explore topics and as they relate to objects in the circus collection. And so today we are starting out with an object that we're honestly gonna kind of build up to because it is one that, that is written with a lot of problems. It's, um, it, it's something that comes out of early 20th century America where there, the degrees of racial stereotypes were ingrained in so much of our mass media. And, and part of that came through in the circus of the time. So I'm gonna work through a little bit of history about the presentation by Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus of the Ubangi Savages, which was a troupe that was brought to this country in 1930 and featured with, with the show. So we're gonna work through this a little bit. Along the way, Mari's gonna jump in and, and add some context to help us understand exactly where our country was in this time and some things that were shaping the way the circus was portraying people. Um, and, and also some, some pers any personal thoughts along the way. We have done a, a lot of early conversations about this program and it's been very helpful to me to hear a variety of opinions because I, I tend to retrench into what I know and my experience of objects is often very different than other people's. So as Laura mentioned, we'll be talking through this, this subject along the way. I wanted to start the presentation about these people who were displayed with the Ringling Show with the people themselves because part of what happens when you're dealing with a, a marketing scheme which the circus is, is a business and the circus of the early 20th century was big business. It infiltrated American culture. It shared new sites and, and novelties across the land and, and really was a form of media in that time period. Before we have internet, before there's nightly news on the TV, the circus is bringing people the world as, as best they could understand it. Um, but it had to be packaged in ways that were palatable. And so I, I went first of all to look for a picture of one of these people, not, not an advertising piece, not a, a tourist photograph, but a photo of a person who would have been called a Ubangi in 1930. I say it that way because Ubangi isn't actually the name of a people. It was a name that was given to this group and then infiltrated out. What's interesting is even now, even looking for contemporary images, you can use the term Ubangi and still find some of these women who, whose culture, part of their culture was to stretch their lips with these plates. It's, it's um, a tradition that had dated back for centuries. And the only per photo I could find that was contemporary to the 1930s, mid-century, this is 1950, uh, that didn't turn the women into objects to be stared at was, was this photo, which I also thought was really interesting. So this is 1950 in Chad and it's a, a Sara tribeswoman and Sara is the actual ethnic identity of the people that we will be referring to along the way as Ubangis. Uh, and this Sara woman has, has, uh, is interacting with an American man, a photographer from, from National Geographic who is showing her a Western publication with photos and the story of her people. And I thought, how appropriate is that? Because this is where the West interfaces. This is, you know, National Geographic is, is a journal that we all look to, to learn from, uh, but it still comes with its own biases. People take photos in certain ways. They, they style the photos, they style the information in a way that is palatable to the public that they're trying to reach. And the circus would be doing the same thing. I wish I could be inside that woman's mind. I mean. You know, what, what does she think of this man showing her a picture of someone 
who looks like her, but is not her. I mean, you know, someone probably she did not know in any way and telling her that this is what we know of you. Um, I, I can't imagine that interaction. So again, to get the, the grounding and the history of the Sara people who are, are really fascinating. The, the ethnic group of Sara people date back to the sixth century BC uh, where they were actually originally located, their homelands are along the, the Nile Delta. But around the 16th century, there was a, 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 an influx of Muslims from, from the Mideast, from Arabia, who came into the area, started taking over lands and started taking people. They, they were implementing a, a slave trade. And the Sara people were among those who were impacted by that. And so somewhere around the, the 16th century, they moved from their homeland around the Nile into this kind of southwest corner of, of the country that we now call Chad. So they lived in this area that's, that's signified by the circle. That was where they had settled. And that is an area which eventually around the 19th century, late 19th century came under French rule. And so it was one of the French colonies and that's how we start to get the Western influx in there. But in this time period, um, while they were leaving, uh, escaping the, the Arab raiders, they developed a, their own cultural roots in, in the Chad area. And they also started this process of stretching the lip of the body modification. Now, the, the history that I can find on this attributes that action to an attempt to change the features of the women to make them less desirable for the, the Arabs who were coming and taking the people. Um, I, this is one of those moments in dealing with history that you have to really get deep into sources because that could be as much of a Western myth. Um, and I know Mari's gonna talk a little bit as we go along, so I'm hoping she'll shed a little more light. But it's these kinds of stories um, and mythologies that, that we all grasp onto to explain things that we don't understand. It, it's very easy to understand why you would wanna change someone's appearance to make sure that you can keep them safe from, from outsiders. Uh, for the circus in the 1930s, they're looking at these kinds of global curiosities. It's a period, it's, it's the end of the, the great age of imperialism the you know colonial powers are, are waning in the world but but their influence has been very broad and so it's an opportunity for circus to bring sites from around the globe that had, have been now infiltrated by western culture and interestingly enough the ubangi tribe just like many other groups that were shown before actually came to the circus after a series of other stints of showing themselves in other places around the world. So we know that there was a, a group of Sara people who were displayed in Germany in the 1920s. They were not termed Ubangis, but they were put on display in what was equivalent to the ethnological congresses and the world's fairs that had come earlier. Um, and I, I want to make the point that the Ubangi was not used in the European display of these people. It was a term that, that actually had no direct bearing on the, the, the Sara people. They did not live near the Ubangi River. The area was known by the French as the Ubangi Chari territory. So there's a little bit of overlap, but the river for which this group that comes to Ringling were named is actually hundreds of miles away and has no direct correlation to the people or their lifestyles. This was one other contemporary image that I was able to find in the 1930s of Sara, Sara individuals. And, and I think it's worth noting that what we focus on today, what we remember from the circus was this modification of the lip plate um, not, which is called a librette, so the stretching of the lip, which was done for the Sara women. We don't particularly notice or talk about with these same people, other body modifications, scarification, and, and the altering of the teeth that you see in this image, um, which would be equally 
un, unseen by American audiences. We've, we've focused very much on the, the female body and the changes there. I did appreciate this image though, because once again, we're looking at people, not, not objects, which is hard to find for that era. So when the circus, when the Ringling Show brought the Sara people to the States, they were displayed, they were, they were a major draw for the circus. The American circus has always banked on a reputation for sharing the world, for, for being a place where you could go learn about something new. And that is something that I struggle with interpreting in circus history because it is obviously loaded. It can be very exploitative. There's, there's that problem. And you see this here with the Ubangis as they were known um, in this time period. They're inside the sideshow tent. And uh, the sideshow tent in and of itself, I think is going to be a conversation that I hope Laura will let me indulge uh, down the road because it's a very interesting interaction when you think about it. So the Sara people have been put on display. You see here five of the women. There were 13 Sara people who came over in 1930 in total. Five of them were men and then eight were women. And they were displayed within the sideshow tent in this format. And then they also were displayed as the, in part of the spectacle, the walk around that opened the show. So that was, that was their part in the performance. But here in the sideshow tent, you have an interesting back and forth of the gaze. So they are there to be stared at, but they are also staring back, which I think is, is the power of the sideshow is you have to be aware that there is a person there in front of you. Um, different people interact differently with that, but, but it is that sense that, that the gaze goes both ways and, and they have to be cognizant of that. The marketing people had great fun with all kinds of mythologies coming in to displaying the Ubangi people. They talked about how the king was stopped at customs because he had too many wives and the United States customs didn't know how to let more than one wife in. So they had to go through this paperwork. It's a made up story, uh, but all of the ways that they could make these people more foreign and more exotic to sell tickets was, was the goal because again, circus is a business. I did want to step back for a second because as much as I can talk about the exploitation that showing people and particularly renaming them and taking their identities it seemed that it has, the life on the circus lot is, is a different moment. So this is a photograph in the collection of, of two of the showgirls for the Ringling Show with two of the Sara women. And Within our collection, we have a, a, a wonderful wire bracelet and it was made by one of the Sara women who had been displayed with Ringling. And she gave it to the showgirl Charlotte Shive uh, when she left the show uh, and asked Charlotte to come visit her in her homeland. So while, um, while what we're dealing with is the public facing side of this, real human connections were possible in the circus. And I don't ever wanna turn away from that fact that it's, you know, there are, there are bright sides to even the most problematic history. And so I think we're gonna jump to Mari and to talk a little more about the people. Well, and thank you, um, Jennifer. And one of the things that uh, when I was asked to um, join into the conversation and Jennifer is sharing the um, images of the 1930s, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Jim Crow. Uh, and the 1930s um, during that time period. Jim Crow stretches really from the 19 teens to the 1950s, early 1960s. Um, but I looked at the image, um, the 1930s image of the, the uh, two ladies and I noticed that there was some body scarification. And so I wanted to highlight, and this is one of the things I, I asked Jennifer, I said, let's put a more contemporary picture of the um, women who are wearing lip plates and uh, have a little bit of a scarification um, to show them in the light that they would have been seen as uh, they're actually preparing for marriage. Um, some of the, the lore that Jennifer was uh, replying, uh, re referencing uh, could have been made up by a Western uh, myth, uh, but we really don't know uh, without getting some more information and actually going to the people who are, um, we're talking about. And so I, I don't wanna say that the narrative 
we want to make sure that it's inclusive, not not what we think, what historians think. We, we really need to have the voices of the ethnic group that we're uh, reviewing and sharing this information about. So when I did my research, I thought it was interesting that I, ch I just chose African uh, beauty beautification of women wearing lip plates uh, and body scarification. And it was amazing some of the things that I saw pop up um, in these articles or uh, references to uh, African women uh, wearing lip plates as exotic. Um, the same terminology that Jennifer was talking about in the 1930s, uh, these articles were uh, 2019, 2016, 2015. Uh, they talked about how harmful uh, that these women may have been harming their bodies and whatnot. Um, so I just wanted to uh, share that with you because even though some of those uh, terminology that we look at as the 1930s uh, is still resonant today and how people are looking at. And then also I, when I said beautification, a lot of the words with beauty was scratched out. And uh, I said, wow, it's who, who defines and who talks about what is beauty? Who defines beauty? It's not a Western culture um, definition. It should be, uh, beauty should be at the all eyes of the beholder, right? So I looked at this and this, this is one of many images I saw and I thought how beautiful this woman looked. Uh, it doesn't fit, quote unquote, the Western culture of beauty of women. But as you can see, her hair, her, uh, she has a shaved head. Um, and that, again, is a, a sign of beauty in this culture, as well as a lip plate. And um, Jennifer did describe about how the lip plates would be, um, how the, the, uh, the women would wear the lip plates. And they would actually remove a, a bottom section of their um, teeth. And so they would pierce their lips so that they can start to put this lip plate. And some of these lip plates, and you, you'll see some of them are made out of clay, some are decorative, some are very large. Um, and so it is a sign of beauty uh, that they're sharing and showing uh, as they're either preparing for marriage or just as we doll up with our earrings, uh, bracelets and things like that. Uh, it may be something that they're going to. And I just wanted to bring to your attention uh, how the colorful uh, necklace uh, this young lady is wearing and the earrings that she's wearing. Uh, it's She's dolled up, ready to go. So uh, I thought it was interesting to have this image uh, in the conversation to show what beautification is and the scarification that um, these women are actually uh, used. Um, and, and you saw it a little bit on the forehead of the image uh, that uh, Jennifer showed earlier. Uh, the scarification, they would use, um, cut themselves and lift up the skin a little bit and make these little dots. And it's beautiful. Uh, sometimes it'll be on their faces, sometimes on their bodies, as well as on their arms uh, to show the beauty and they were in the patterns. So I just wanted to share that and more contemporary picture of women wearing these uh, lip plates. And this actually, this woman is from uh, Ethiopia and not in Chad, but uh, just wanted to share that. So I just, just had that conversation, Jennifer, as to juxtapose what was uh, the 1930s and what is today. Well, and I, I really appreciate that addition, Mari, because I, looking at this image while you're talking to, I think you were bringing up questions about agency, right? That. Um, you know, that this woman has made a, a choice as part of her cultural tradition. This is a way she is proud to present herself. And that question of agency is one that plagues the circus with the display of human beings, right? When we get to the sideshow tent, there is that difficulty of, did this person want to be on display? And so that's a, that's a big question to parse out. And with the Sara people that were displayed as Ubangis, it's particularly difficult because there's uh, one, the, the actual historic documents that tell you how they came to be there are a little muddled by the, the PR work that goes into selling an act. So it's a little hard to understand what happened. Um, I, as I mentioned, I know that they had been toured elsewhere. I know that they're homeland was was colonized at that point and I know it was very contentious the the French colonization of that region of Central Africa at the time was very hard on the people there so you know was was there a benefit 
to this group to not being at home? Were, were they somehow able to, to send resources back home? These are questions that I don't have the answers to, but, but I think are important, you know, before we open judgment any which way to understand what motivated all sides. Um, before we leave this image, I, I wanna say too, what I, what I love about this, and it's something I, that I, I pay attention to in photos is when you, I'm gonna back up for a second. When you look here, um, at this, this photograph, the two showgirls know what to do in front of a camera, right? They know how to look at the person taking their picture. They know just a little bit of how to pose. Um, there, there, is, there is something stylized about their presentation and they're very comfortable with it. Uh, the two sorrow women look at one another, um, I, which I think is really interesting. This is, you know, I, my sense is that they were fine being with the two white women, but it was this question of what is this world? Why are you taking our photos? There's, there is no agency in that photograph for them. They, you know, they are just part of the group. Whereas the woman, the contemporary image very clearly owns it and she knows she's being looked at and she is, you know, empowered by that. So I want to also say, Jennifer, just as you're, and I want you to all focus on this image of this young lady. Um, because even though, um, you know, the, the two, uh, the picture that, uh, the slide that you went back to uh, show that some of the women had upper late lip plates and lower lip plates, this woman has a lower mm -hmm. lip plate, yeah. Uh, so there are different ethnic groups that use lip plates, uh, different size lip plates to show up beauty. Uh, but if we go to that other, uh, the contemporary side, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you flow, uh, Jennifer, <laughs> is that I want to let you see how beautiful her, her face is. Uh, she doesn't have a frown or any kind of scowl on her, her eyebrows aren't, because I want you to keep that in mind, because as we go through this presentation, you're going to see how um, the, um, the image of the women have been betrayed. Uh, and you'll get to that when, we, when Jennifer starts to talk about how they looked and had this frown in their face. Um, but this woman is clearly smiling for the camera, uh, just like Jennifer said, owned it. And, uh, and that's the reason why I, I had several other pictures, but she was so beautiful to me. And I said, wow, her, her skin color and the, the shape of her head. And, and we also think of hair as a woman's, you know, we don't, we want to make sure our, our hair looks really good. Well, in her culture, it was okay to be uh, shaved, that her hair is shaved. So uh, just wanted to bring that out, but beautiful, beautiful. Well, and it's, it's a nice transition because from here we go back to the 1930s and what we're going to look at next is the advertising material that was created to, to bring attention to the Ubangis as they were presented at the circus. And um, you can see here, we have the Ringling Brothers Barnum Bailey presents the tribe of genuine Ubangi savages, new to civilization from Africa's darkest depths uh, with mouths and lips as large as those of full grown crocodiles. So the circus has gone all in, the circus marketing machine. I, I, I do, as I go through this, want to, to be clear that this is, this is media created to reach a market. It is appealing to a broader American market. Um, so it, again, there are human beings in this story and then there's, there's a business and a social side that is what this marketing is feeding into. So in this image, uh, you know, the, the language, first of all, immediately associates them with animals, associates this whole group with animals and has very clearly put the individuals on display uh, in, in a way that, that everyone is very still and static. There is there is no autonomy, there is no agency to this group. They are there to be stared at. Um, so, and this, again, this is where we see the introduction of the term Ubangi. So Roland Butler, who was a tremendous force in, in circus marketing, uh, and, and really was behind a lot of the, the most successful marketing campaign, campaigns of the, the first half of the 20th century, was the person that, that came up with the term Ubangi to name this group. Um, they were most definitively the Sara people. They were from this territory that, had, that was sometimes known by the French as Ubangi Chari. So there is a chance that he's picked it up from that, but, but he, he would have known that that was not the name 
of their ethnic group. So it, it's a choice that's made at that point to call them something that sounds more exotic. I mean, it, it, you know, I'll be honest, it's a, it's a fun word to say, right? It's, it, it's an interesting word, Ubangi. It's, uh, it does sound exotic and interesting. So it, does, it hits all the markers that a marketing person would want to have. Um, so uh, Roland Butler has come up with this. This is again, 1930. And this is where I'm gonna hand it off because he has developed this marketing campaign within a broader social system that, that Mari is gonna tell us a little bit more about. Uh, can you go back to that slide the, yeah. uh, that's uh, before? And I wanted to talk a little bit, and I think um, Laura alluded to this about trauma, uh, reviewing and looking at objects. Uh, one of the things that I said to Laura and Jennifer uh, that some of the um, images and some of the objects in the collection are very offensive. And so I did say to my two colleagues, you're gonna have to give me some time to digest this. Uh, and I didn't wanna make light of this um, because when we are presenting objects to the public, uh, we have to have space for them to receive it and really to think about what this is. Uh, and it also is traumatizing to the people who are working with this collection. So I had to tell Laura and um, Jennifer, uh, don't spring it up to me uh, the day before. Give me a chance to review it and to walk and work through it. Because emotionally, this picture is offensive to me. And uh, even though I work in collections, I've been doing it for a number of years. I worked in different museums and a lot of um, different collections that I've been a part of um, to process, uh, I still, have issues and problems with looking at images that are offensive. So I wanted to just uh, uh, say that because uh, sometimes we systematically go through our jobs because and we don't put our emotions in it, um, but sometimes we can't do it all the time. Um, and so I had to take some time to review this image, this poster image, and it took me a couple of days over the weekend to review. Uh, because of the way the not only the image of these people um, being portrayed with um, comparing themselves to or this this media is comparing them them to animals, uh, the elongated lip, even though it's a lip plate, they still painted it as lips, this red ruby lips, uh, darkened skin, even. We have to be mindful of that. Oh, did I get cut out? You did, but you seem like you're back and you're fine now. Okay. okay. So I just wanted to say is that when we're looking at putting objects on display, it's an interpretation and we also need to be mindful of how we're reviewing this to the public. So I just wanted to uh, share that with you all that uh, this, this piece and other pieces um, is a little hard sometimes to look at, uh, even though that's part of my job. Uh, but we have to be mindful, the public is also looking at these things too. So, um, but I will go ahead, uh, if you can, uh, Jennifer. I'll go to the that little button again, there we go. Okay, so um, this is the reason why I chose this uh, slide um, and we're talking about blackface. Um, advertisement in the United States, basically in the 1930s and 1950s. I could have went up to the 20s, but I just wanted to um, really kind of highlight the 1930s since this was the time period uh, that, the, that we were talking about uh, the posters and the objects that uh, is part of this presentation. And again, the blackface, uh, it is very hard to look at this image uh, in its, um, this was really filtrated uh, through um, the United States and this was being stream culture or pop culture of the time. And remember I was talking about Jim Crow time period. Um, and, and I know there's another slide we'll get into, but uh, this is all encased uh, during this uh, period of saying, well, we can uh, advertise and show uh, people of color, particularly African-Americans as if they are subhuman or not human at all. And so we're gonna exaggerate some of the features uh, one of the things is the big lips and making them red. There's no way a person's lips are that red, right? But it's an exaggeration. Also, the bugging of the eyes, 
no reason why the, the eyes are supposed to be that wide, but again, it's, it's the media and advertisement, as well as the darkened skin or the blackening of the skin. So uh, this again, uh, is playing off of what media advertisement of pop culture during the 1930s through the 50s was accepted. Uh, that is where um, uh, the circus poster that we saw before. But if we can go to the next slide. I had to talk about where this all came from. Um, and we can re uh, really kind of trace back this Jim Crow character to minstrel shows. Um, and uh, this is uh, an etching of 1830s. Notice I say 18 uh, in the 1800s, not in the 1900s, but the 1830s to the 1850s. Um, Jim Crow was a minstrel character that was really created um, or really popularized by a song called uh, Jump Jim Crow. And a gentleman who his name is um, uh, Thomas Dartmouth, or Daddy Rice, as we called him, or he was known as Daddy Rice, um, he actually popularized the Jim Crow character, meaning someone who might have been of uh, an older enslaved uh, man or a boy uh, and dancing and dancing to a little song and and that name was Jim Crow came about. Uh, Jim Crow uh, was performed, um, Daddy Rice or uh, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, he performed this in 1828 on the stage, uh, but uh, it became popularized really in the 1930s uh, particularly. Um, and it also gave way to what we know about Jim Crow laws and black code laws. And that is the segregation of African-Americans uh, with uh, any kind of laws or uh, way of life. So the Jim Crow-ism uh, really played in part of shaping the um, United States media or advertisement at the time. So I wanted to kind of give this um, where this came from, this Jim Crow time period, because the advertisements that are coming out of the Jim Crow uh, 1930s is going to really play into the popular culture of entertainment and circus uh, and movies and whatnot for entertainment. A lot of time that these um, songs, minstrel songs uh, were very offensive. Uh, and the characters that they used uh, mainly was uh, uh, white men dressed in um, old clothes and black in their faces to mimic uh, particularly an enslaved person or a person of color, an African-American person as what they thought was funny. Uh, so that was the way they did this little jig or Jim, jump Jim Crow. So if we can go to the next slide. And so when I talk about um, looking at the circus poster that Jennifer shared with us uh, earlier, um, these images uh, come to mind of what uh, was happening in the United States during the 1930s and 50s. And I'm just using that time period, but it was earlier than that. Uh, Cause really uh, we can trace all of this uh, really after the civil war, uh, after reconstruction. Uh, particularly 1877, when there was um, this equality that African Americans were trying to have with the, um, the passing of the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments, the 13th being the abolishment of slavery, 14th citizenship, and 15th voting. Um, so we have that, I'm just running through it, history really fast, um, but just to say that uh, this particular Jim Crow, our black codes came because of the, the uh, aftermath of the reconstruction uh, period of 1877, when African-Americans are now trying to have equality. Uh, so these images that were coming up, particularly in the early 1900s, uh, were to make sure that African-Americans were seen not as equal, but more or less uh, reviewed as childlike, or even animal-like. So this image right here, I know you all are trying to look at it. It is the chicken coon inn. And this is very hard for me to look at too. And I've seen it in many places. Um, and this is a menu uh, at the chicken coon inn. Uh, that's a derogatory term, coon, uh, which was short for raccoon. 
Uh, it was another Sly Coon was a char minstrel character that's also just the same way with a Jim Crow was a minstrel ca character that was started. And that advertisement of someone with big lips, eyes bulging, and somebody that we call him a coon because he was supposed to be very slick and very smart and really didn't know his place, uh, making sure that he didn't quote unquote uh, become too equal to uh, white Americans. So this in itself is uh, one of the advertisements that mimics uh, the poster that you saw earlier with even though those women were wearing lip plates, they still were, uh, their lips were uh, put as red or darkened, their skin was darkened. And this, uh, unfortunately, uh, this Coon Chicken Inn uh, menu, uh, this was a restaurant that was uh, in the upper um, uh, west. And this one is really from Seattle, Washington, but it, they were all over the place and they were starting in Utah. Um, and it was very offensive to African-Americans who didn't eat at this uh, establishment, um, but they were subjected to this image of advertisement. Um, and some of the uh, folks from the NAACP fought back, but was fined um, because they um, wanted to not see this logo all over the place. But I just wanted to share with you that advertisement, the power of advertisement and entertainment uh, was very rampant in the country during the 1930s. You saw it in movies. I know some of you probably might know about the movie Night, uh, Gone with the Wind that was in 1939. Um, advertisements uh, with Babes in Arms with Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney. And, and that was another 1939 with blackface and red lips and things like that. So again, this was acceptable in the, uh, the United States culture. Next slide. I also want to talk about advertisements of products too. And this again is uh, something that is of the 1920s. Um, but again, uh, just looking at uh, how African uh, people are being portrayed and darkened uh, skin and ruby lips. So, uh, but this is the gold, tw gold dust twins that was uh, popularized in the, in the 30s and 40s. So Jennifer. You're, you're on mute. <laughs> My computer just told me that, sorry. I, I Thank you, Mari. I, I wanted to say that where Mari began this about slowing down to take a look at these images is, is the biggest takeaway that I have gotten from the conversations we, we have done preparing for this because I get so analytical very quickly. Um, you know, I, I look at, at, at the facts and the figures of the history and, and I have the privilege of having some space from some of these images. They, you know, that, that's something that I have to be very aware of because I immediately go to, isn't it fascinating that the French had colonized and the, that this meant that they were interested. I, I pick apart that and I stop thinking about the human reaction very quickly. So I, I really appreciate Mari helping me to remember to slow it down. Um, and and to, to open up where I'm starting to think about these topics. I know instinctively that, you know, th that they are difficult. The Ubangi posters, um, and I'm actually gonna move forward to another one of them, are pieces that I have not put out on display in any other context, because again, I, I, I have the awareness that they need so much more explanation than I'm generally able to give. Um, coming back to the posters and the era. First, I wanna comment, I think that it's fascinating that even down to the use of colors, right? That the golds and the reds that permeated all of the advertising material that Mari showed us is the language that has been picked up. Now, red's pretty common in circus advertising, but the, the big fields of yellow, I guess we're coming in in this era. It's just very interesting to me that there is that, that repetition that they've picked up all of the aesthetics that are tied into that way of, of depicting black stereotypes. So this is one other poster from the 1930s. And I, again, talking about the way one's gaze works, this person has been depicted solely as an object to be stared at for their, for their lips. Uh, what I find in my analytical brain, really amazing about this period of time is how quickly media images like this permeated other venues. 
So this is a, a postcard from an exhibition that was staged at the Chicago Natural History Museum, the Field Museum in 1933. So three years following the display, sorry guys, of the Ubangis uh, in, with the circus. And this was an exhibit of bronze sculptures that had been commissioned by the field from an artist named Malvina Hoffman. Uh, and she had worked with with the curators of the Field Museum to identify the uh, races of mankind. It, it was basically racial types. A hun over a hundred sculptures of various racial types were on display in this field. The Field Museum has since gone back and, and looked historic, like from contemporary view at this exhibition, and they've done a really good job unpacking their own complicated history and in, in basically racially profiling the races of the world. Uh, but what struck me with this particular one is you see the form that it takes, which is so very closely aligned to the circus poster. I think it's really kind of astounding. And I'm sorry, I couldn't get a bigger image of this postcard, but on the back, they actually labeled it as Ubangi woman. So in three short years, the Field Museum has embraced this term that came with the circus for a group of people. Uh, so it, it, it speaks, you know, on one hand to that, that influence of the circus on American culture, which I always do find very interesting, but, but also the problematic nature of mass media. When we're sharing information into big groups, if that information isn't good from the start, uh, it, it can be disseminated in, in really hurtful, terrible ways that linger. Uh, because that use of the phrase Ubangi now, I think it has, has some resonance in American culture and people do recognize it. So all of this has been an overview to work up to the actual object in the collection that started this dialogue for us. So we have within the circus collection, one piece that uh, would have been a collectible piece, I suppose, uh, created in the 1930s. I, I do want to be clear that what I'm about to show you is not actually, I have no proof that it was made or sold by the circus. It is, it is an artifact that comes from this time period and that much like this sculpture at the field is inherently influenced by the circus's display of the Sara people as the Ubangis. And so among the things created in that time period for Westerners to, to collect and feel that they had some knowledge of this foreign exotic world is this piece. Um, it is about eight inches long. It's not, it's not a full size. This is actually an ashtray. It was created to mimic one of the Sara women, one of the Ubangi women, and was used as, as an ashtray. Uh, it was a collectible at that time. And, and startling enough, there actually are multiple variations on an ashtray created like this with the lip serving as the, the place of the ash. Um, this is obviously, I, I, when you pull apart the depiction of a person you're taking their head, uh, that's problematic. Using a person's head, their, their body as an ashtray is, is unthinkable. I mean, it's astounding and terrible. Uh, so it comes to beg the question, what do we as a museum do with objects like this? Um, this is exactly where I was when trying to, to start to address these questions. I really wanted to put this on display to open it up, but realized with colleagues who gave me wonderful advice along the way that a label text was not going to do it, that as, as Mari and, and Laura have referenced that some people would be traumatized in ways that I, I couldn't begin to understand uh, by this object being there without a great deal of context to it. And, and frankly, it's more context than I think that we can do in, in label writing at the moment because we have worked through this now for pretty close to our hour, I think, um, you know, trying to give a full fleshed out story of, of how do we get to these objects? And so we are, that's, that's the question that we're asking is how do we assure that these stories don't get lost? This object belongs in the collection because it represents in the story that we should not forget. 
but how do we do it in ways that are respectful and meaningful and open dialogue? So I'm hoping that Mari will jump in at this point because I think for us at least, it's certainly done that. Uh, and, and let me, I know it's mindful of time because we would like to hear uh, questions from everyone. Uh, so just hold on. Uh, but I wanted to say when I first saw this object and, and thank you, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer and I talked a little bit about this, uh, not knowing the context. And I, you know, again, was in the midst of trying to get a building open and exhibit open. And so I was in the midst of trying to say, like, okay, uh, not digesting. But then when I slowed down and Jennifer and I talked, uh, the piece, I was like, wait a minute, whoa, how, how are we going to interpret? What's the interpretation? And, and that's what we have to be very sensitive. And I think that's why I enjoy being a public historian, really talking to other colleagues, understanding not just um, my own culture, but other cultures uh, to see what the interpretation is. How do you one uh, channel and have other voices that talk about this narrative and the story? And uh, one of the things that I think museums have a, a duty to do is not only to preserve objects, but make it, make it as a teaching tool. So anything that I have come across, I wanna make sure that we have some dialogue conversation and some real good conversation about it and, uh, and trying to learn from each other uh, what it is that we need to be uh, displaying as well as uh, letting people know. So we can learn from each other. We don't have all the answers, uh, but I also wanted to make a point real quickly and then I'm gonna let uh, Laura take it on, is that one thing was offensive to me when um, Jennifer said that this was an ashtray Remember, we had talked about the lip plate being symbolic as a, as a, a symbol of beauty. Um, and this is that part of the culture to only say somebody's going to flick your ash onto this. This was, this was um, really something in the 1930s and through the 50s. There were toys, there were products there. And that's why I wanted to show that, uh, that menu from the Chicken Coon Inn or uh, Chicken Coon Inn uh, to show how ingrained uh, the culture, pop culture, it could have been any like a cookie jar or anything like that uh, and how insensitive uh, these images were shown and that African Americans or people of color had to endure that and that was to traumatize uh, going every day looking at objects that you may not be able to uh, say anything about but it's in your face. So just an FYI on that. Uh, so I'm, I know we are short of time but I hope everybody will ask some questions. Yeah, so at this point for our participants, if you would like to unmute um, and share any comments or questions, I know a few came in over the chat during the course of the presentation, um, but I guess really just, I think, you know, we're, we're curious to hear your reaction. How do we, how do we grapple with these objects? What is your response as the viewer to something like this? Um, what, what questions remain for you? Um, so we're really kind of opening it up to however you want to share. I find some of the images truly shocking, actually. Um, and I don't know if anybody could see my facial expressions as some of these images popped up onto the screen, but I found them disturbing. So I can I can imagine how difficult it is for an African American to look at. And the only context that I think one might display these to the public today would be if we wanted to um, show just how terribly these people were portrayed back in the bad old days, or maybe make them part of um, a series of images that show a progression from those bad old days to the way um, African Americans are portrayed today, and you know, maybe show that perhaps we haven't come all the way, but we've you know made an effort to to progress. Yeah, I think Ingrid, you're you're right. It's it's just incredibly difficult. But having a context of 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 learning and seeing how things have changed is really important. I do struggle from the side of the circus that there are all kinds of problems. I mean, that, that particular marketing of, of, of individual people um, with all of the racial, racial stereotypes that were embedded in American culture at the time is, is inexcusable, but 
the circus has this tradition, and I, I noticed in your comments, actually, Ingrid, that you talked about National Geographic being for education and the circus being for entertainment. But the circus did provide education in a time period where people didn't have access to other media. The problem we have is, is that transmission of information. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that it was very difficult for me to find any kind of humanizing photographs of the Sara people that were contemporary to the ringling display of the Ubangis. Uh, and what that was is what photographs existed were mediated through the Western world. So Western photographers went and said, this is what you people should look like so that we can sell your image. Um, and, and so from the start, even if the circus was trying sincerely to bring information and exposure to a broader world, the, the, the entire circuit of communication was already um, uh, what, what would be the word already polluted already you know already gone awry so and that to me is an interesting thing for us to remember that that sometimes the best attempt you make to share information is still is still made bad by the the source because the source perhaps is not as you know was not what you thought it was uh, so it's it's to me it's a question to keep grappling with and and the biggest thing is I do not want to hide from these topics in circus. I also don't want them to be, to me, none of these are, are issues that are clear contrast. It's not black and white. It's, it's this question of what was happening in the world, what, what made it like this so that we can do better, right? We, we do better when we understand what created the kinds of stereotypes that we knew. Uh, and so I, I have a, a real goal to use our circus collections to explore that and, and help us reflect upon ourselves. And I would like so far beyond the language to, uh, so far beyond the image to include the language that was on the posters, the, you know, the word savages and the comparison to uh, lips as big as the mouths of crocodiles. I mean, so, so the language in addition to the image made it even worse. Mari, you had something to say? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, I don't know if I'm even, uh, I guess I am on, uh, internet's getting kind of wicky. Um, but I just wanted to say is that dialogue is really the key to really reviewing objects and keeping the conversation open. Um, because of when I feel, find out that uh, when you have uh, different voices at the table, and I think that's what Jennifer was alluding to, is grappling and, and having that conversation you will be able to understand the, the, the sources of things and the, like I said, the context. Uh, we don't want, and that's what I was talking to Jennifer when we early were looking at this ashtray, what's the context? Where are we at? Uh, this was in the 1930s, this, the Jim Crow time period, what was going on in the country at that point, advertisement. But again, this is where these uh, topics for us to discuss, dialogue, understanding, uh, getting different points of view, uh, is, is going to be always uh, beneficial to us uh, as, as we begin to review the collection. And I think I'm seeing a, a couple of questions come through the chat from Faith. And I think it goes back to your earlier point, Jennifer, about sort of the agency and the motivation of the Sara people in their participation and just sort of fleshing out a little bit more of their story as you know, participants in these circus acts. So Faith is asking, uh, where did they go in the off season? Um, and then also wondering about how were they treated at the circus when they weren't working or performing? Um, do we have any evidence of that that comes from the people themselves or is it mostly circus? And can you maybe just speak a little bit more to that? I, I, I will speak a little bit to it. We don't have a lot of good firsthand information. We don't, we don't have anything specifically that, that I'm aware of, certainly not within the Ringling collections, but I'm not aware in a broader way of, of very specific uh, reactions or, or correspondence or, or any first hand documents that tell us their experience on the circus. We do have these kind of peripheral stories. I mentioned Charlotte Shive, who was was a performer with the Ringling Show, was um, an aerialist and a showgirl and, and had a firsthand relationship. The bracelet that, that we have came to us from an immediate friend of Charlotte's. Um, so it's a very, very direct lineage, direct provenance. So that story I feel confident about. Now, I, I still can't speak to the depths of that relationship, but to me, a token like that, a handmade item 
is something very personal. So to have made the effort to exchange that says, says something, there is some kind of relationship formed there. Um, but, but their exact experience, I don't know. It, looking at the photos of the Sara people who were displayed in Germany, there's a few photos of them uh, on the streets and they were, they were made to, to wrap up completely so that no one, because they were an attraction, people wanted to sell tickets so they couldn't be seen on the streets. Um, and so I, I think that that was the reality that, that these people came and because they were brought in as attractions, they were kept away from the general public. It's not, you know, when, when I go travel in the world, I get to go and explore new places and see new things. That was not their experience. They were on display. They traveled and with the circus, uh, you know, nobody with the circus got to go explore anything. They were moving every single day. So it was just the life and the interactions on the lot. And I, I don't have much more than that, unfortunately. You, you never know when something good might turn up, so. So it looks like we're, we're right at the hour. I know some people have to go. Um, maybe if there's any last questions, Jennifer and Mari, if you wanna just stay on, but if I, I understand, you know, for the other participants, if you have to log off, thank you for, for joining us today. And again, look for additional uh, conversations in this series as we continue to um, unpack some of the stories of the circus.